Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Hello, I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public, and I welcome you to Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations. Today, we're very honored to have with us Kim Lewis, University Distinguished Professor and Founder Director of the Antimicrobial Discovery Center at Northeastern University. Dr. Lewis is an internationally recognized expert in microbial drug resistance, and lately he's been in the news a great deal because his lab's breakthrough development of an antibiotic that seems to overcome drug-resistant bacteria. This is a very significant thing because, as you know, antibiotic resistance has led to a public health crisis. Dr. Lewis is a permanent member of the NIH Drug Discovery and Drug Resistance Studies section. He's also a fellow of the American Society of Microbiology, and he's received numerous awards and patents for his work. In addition, he's the founder of two biotech companies, Novo Biotic Pharmaceuticals and Arietas Corporation. Today, Dr. Lewis will discuss his latest and possibly greatest innovation, an apparently fail-proof antibiotic called Taxoactin that has caused a great deal of excitement in both the scientific world and in the media. It is a great honor to welcome Dr. Kim Lewis. Dr. Lewis, welcome. Uh, thank you, Yvonne. Uh, thank you for having me. I just want to s start uh, by saying that uh, we're, of course, excited about uh, Texobactin, but it is a result of an effort of several teams, and probably as our uh, conversation unfolds, I'll tell you uh, more about Okay, that. that's just fine. But it, can I start, though, with just getting some background? I think people are aware that we have a crisis with, uh, you know, the antibiotics uh, today. Can you give us a little background about how antibiotics were discovered and what happened? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, so uh, the first highly successful antibiotic, as we all know, uh, was penicillin. Uh, it's, and uh, it was discovered by accident. Uh, uh, a fungus spore uh, landed on a partially open petri dish that, where some staphylococcus was inoculated. and. Uh, uh, and Fleming noticed that there was no growth of the Staphylococcus uh, around the fungus. Mm -hmm. So uh, he had uh, the foresight uh, to conclude that the fungus was making an antimicrobial compound, and that led to the isolation of penicillin. Uh, uh, a number of years later, in, in the 40s, uh, Selman Waxman, working mm -hmm. at Rutgers University, uh, decided that he will going to, is going to use Fleming's discovery to systematically uh, discover new antibiotics. Mm. Uh, so his idea was very simple. Uh, he thought that he will take uh, soil microorganisms, and he was focusing on actinomycetes that turned out to be the most prolific producers of antibiotics, that he would take uh, one uh, colony of actinomycetes uh, at a time, apply it to a petri dish overlaid with uh, the same uh, staphylococcus or another pathogen and look for zones of inhibition, just like Fleming did. Mm -hmm. By accident, mm -hmm. he would do it systematically. Mm -hmm. And so he did that, and that was enormously successful. Uh, he discovered uh, streptomycin mm -hmm. and was awarded the Nobel Prize, both for streptomycin and for the method. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the method was then picked up by uh, a number of pharmaceutical companies like, uh, you know, Merck and Pfizer and Eli Lilly. Uh, and really what they are today is in large part uh, can be traced to the, their discoveries of antibiotics that mm -hmm. transformed both them as companies and medicine as a field. And when they did all these great and wonderful things, it looked like the cure for everything. What happened that people maybe didn't expect initially that, that, made, that led to the antibiotic crisis? Right, uh, right from the very beginning, uh, it was clear 
to experts, maybe not necessarily to the public and to right. the doctors, but to the experts that uh, there are, were some cases of resistance to penicillin, to streptomycin, and mm -hmm. to other mm -hmm. antibiotics as, as they uh, were being discovered and, intru and introduced. Uh, but that did not seem at the time, at the time meaning the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, like a big problem because there was plenty of antibiotics that mm. were discovered, plenty of classes of antibiotics were being discovered. And the discovery far outpaced uh, the resistance acquisition and, and spread mm -hmm. by the pathogens. Mm -hmm. So resistance seemed more like a nuisance rather than a real problem. But then it became a real problem. And it became a problem. Is, is it because of the overuse of the, of the uh, antibiotics? Uh, it seems pervasive. Now it's in our meat, it's in uh, everybody's taking them all the time. Was that the difficulty or would it have been inevitable just because of the mutation rate? Yeah, there were, uh, there were two different factors mm -hmm. that contributed to our uh, present uh, uh, perilous state of uh, antibiotic resistance. Uh, so one was, as you said, uh, Ivan, you're, you're absolutely right, it is the uh, wide availability and yeah. overuse of antibiotics, uh, y using antibiotics uh, when people really have viral infections, for <laughs> example, uh, that has been pretty standard, or uh, a very uh, wide use of antibiotics uh, as over-the-counter medications in a lot of uh, third world countries uh, where you do not need a prescription. Yeah. Um, so so that has been, of course, uh, a major component. And then, of course, also the use of antibiotics uh, uh, f you know, for growth promotion of farm right. animals. But apart from that, uh, if we would have continued the discovery uh, at the pace uh, of the 40s and 50s, we'd probably, we'd probably be okay today in spite of the misuse uh, of antibiotics. Uh, but that was not the case. Uh, the rapid discovery and introduction of new classes uh, abruptly ceased in the early 60s. Uh. Like somebody turned off the uh, discovery process. And why? Uh, so that we can fairly confidently trace the overmining of the main source of antibiotics that Selman Waxman was working with I and see. introduced. So it turns out that uh, about one percent of soil microorganisms uh, are species that we can culture in the lab yeah, easily, right. and the remaining ninety-nine percent of species, uh, for a variety of reasons, do not want to grow on our petri dishes. And so if you have a limited resource of something, then of course that's going to be overmined. Right. And so uh, in, after the 60s, uh, people realized that they are spending their time rediscovering penicillin and streptomycin. I see. Uh, instead of discovering new classes of antibiotics. So let me get this straight. Part of this was the problem of the culturing in the petri dish, what could be cultured in the petri dish. This is where you come in, I think, that you turn back to where 99% of the bacteria were, right. uh, and, and you came up with a, a very different method. So uh, my colleague from Northeastern, uh, uh, Dr. Slava Epstein, yes. uh, who is a uh, microbial ecologist, and I have been uh, thinking about that problem, first independently and then jointly. So we joined forces uh, a while ago and decided uh, that this is a fascinating basic science problem. We were right. motivated just by the puzzle. Just because I, of that. At the time, I must say, we, we, of course we realized that it would be uh, probably useful if we uh, learned how to grow them, but our primary motivation at the time was uh, to solve the problem. Right. What yes. is, yes, the problem? Uh, well, that is the problem. Why uh, do bacteria uh, not grow on our petri dishes when we seemingly add wonderful nutrients uh, yeah. on our petri dishes, right. you know, sugars and amino acids, that would be exactly what's available to them in the soil, the breakdown products yeah. of plant and animal matter. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, a hundred years of tinkering with uh, conditions on the petri dish didn't allow us to move from that one percent upwards. Uh, the phenomenon itself, uh, this inability to grow the vast majority of species uh, on a petri dish, is known in the profession as the Great Plate Count Anomaly. 
Oh. Uh -huh. So it's the difference between the number of bacteria that you can observe under the microscope and count them. Mm -hmm. And if you then take the same uh, cells and put them on a Petri dish, well, there's a, a great plate count anomaly. Only 1% of them are going to grow. And that was discovered in the 19th century by Winterberg, uh, an Austrian microbiologist. So this is the oldest uh, problem, unsolved problem in microbiology. Was it a problem, by the way, with penicillin too? They couldn't make enough of it? Did that have anything to, I didn't. That's a different problem. Okay. So they, of course, they could grow the fungus, but in the beginning, the fungus did not want to make a lot of penicillin. I see. It apparently made exactly uh, the amount, the, the fungus needed. I see. Not the amount that we needed. Exactly. Right? We so needed right, vastly, wasn't into mass production. <laughs> vastly, <laughs> right, right. Uh, but you amounts. were yes, yeah. you you worked with a different situation. Yeah, that's a different mm -hmm. that's a different problem. Uh, and so uh, and so what Slava and I came up with was a, a very simple really consideration. We realized that you know th there's a vast uh, negative experience of trying to come up with a wonderful media that's yeah. going to grow everything. And we realized that that's not going to work. That's not what we want to do. We also realized that uncultured bacteria do grow in their natural environment. Yeah. And so that's where we are going to grow them. So then the question was coming up with a gadget to do that. And the gadget we came up with is a diffusion chamber. Uh, so idea, the idea is very simple. You take a sample. Uh, let's say a marine sediment that uh -huh. we started working with, or soil, uh, you dilute it, uh, mix uh, with agar, and then you sandwich it between two semi-permeable membranes. Uh, those get glued on an O-ring, which uh, uh, we get in a hardware store. Uh, and so uh, now you take this diffusion chamber and put it back, let's say, in the soil where the sample originated from. Uh, everything diffuses through the semi-permeable membrane. So essentially, we trick the bacteria. They yes. don't know that something happened to them, right? And they, and they of course, grow and form colonies. Uh, so that was our uh, initial big b breakthrough uh, to, see, to see that. Uh, and that, for the first time, gave us access uh, to these elusive, uncultured microorganisms. I see. When I saw the gadget that I think that you're talking about, and I will insert it in, in the video, I thought, you know, that seems so obvious. <laughs> Why hasn't somebody done this? Was it obvious, or did you spend a long time getting to that? Why you was know, it so difficult? You know, the, uh, the, the, the basic idea seemed rather obvious to uh -huh, us. Uh -huh. And then we put together the first diffusion chamber and nothing worked. Ah. Right. And then we spent quite a while, uh, you know, tinkering, realizing that we need to tinker with conditions, uh, optimize it, but really nothing, nothing radical, I would say. Yeah. Uh, right. So it had to be of a certain, uh, you know, uh, it had to be very thin for, for good diffusion. The membranes themselves, the first uh, chamber we put in the soil, uh, bacteria and nematodes ate it up, the membrane, so because they're the membrane. Yeah, uh, made of <laughs> nitrocellulose, of course. We could have I imagined see. that. Yes. Uh, that will be eaten, <laughs> but we didn't. So, so, you know, each and every problem that you, you can imagine, uh, yeah. we could have encountered, we did. Uh, but then, you know, we optimized it, uh, and it did work. Uh, so, uh, in a way, yes, the idea uh, is, is simple and obvious, and when we uh, tried to patent this, uh, uh, we were greeted with skepticism uh, from I'm the patent sure, examiner yes. uh, because she said this is so obvious, uh, <laughs> you know, but uh, so our counter-argument uh, was, but, uh, well, if it's so obvious, why didn't, why didn't uh, <laughs> anyone come up with it, right? right? So. Uh, so that, so, so I'm tempted uh, to yes. ask that mm -hmm. too. Why didn't somebody? Yeah, it sounds like okay, you no. tinkered. So I wanted yeah, to yeah. try to find out how long that took. But yeah. the, the the everybody knew about the benefits of the soil bacteria, correct? Mm -hmm. A potential benefit. The potential, of right? Those uncultured uh, soil yeah, bacteria. Yeah, right. You see, I, I would say there, there are probably uh, uh, two different things. Well, first of all. Uh, 
uh, there's this there's a tradition, right? So in microbiology, there's a tradition. Tradition here is a petri dish. <laughs> you <Right. laughs> bacteria, you grow them in a petri dish. Yes, like, right. like, like yes, that's like right. ABC, it has to work right? that way. So, so that's one thing that which is kind of hard of uh, <laughs> you know dispensing with. Uh, uh, but another thing, uh, of course, uh, microbiologists have thought about this problem. And there, w there was, there was, you know, a list of reasons why, possible reasons why they don't grow in the lab. And one was really a killer, one of the reasons, uh, potential reasons. Yeah. So w uh, one of the explanation was that uh, these are simply the vast majority of uh, bacteria in the environment are simply extremely slow growing. So maybe they divide once a month or once a year. So you never see a colony on your petri dish. But if you wait for a couple of years, you'll see colonies. But who has a couple of years? Yes, right? Exactly. So essentially, the proposition was that this is a boring problem. Uh -huh. right? This is, first of all, a boring problem. Uh -huh. And secondly, it will have no practical significance. Yes, I understand. Right? Yeah. And that was another barrier that I think prevented right. a lot of people from, from going there. Right. So. Were you in a distinct minority then developing this thing? I can't imagine we that labs distinct, were not trying to figure this out. Uh, we were in distinct minority. Yeah. Indeed, yes. Uh, and then met yeah. with skepticism. And uh, some skepticism. Yes. Yeah. But you know, but the results are simple. You know. Yes. You can reproduce them. But regarding the gas, so uh, the original diffusion chamber that we put together. Yeah. Uh, it is still used, uh, so we license that technology to Nova Biotic Pharmaceuticals. Okay. It's a startup biotech company uh, in Cambridge, uh, not far from here. Uh, and uh, the I initial diffusion chamber is still working. Okay. Uh, uh, it's still working. But since then, we came up with a, a number of modifications. And I think what you might have seen both in our paper and the press. Yeah. Uh, is is a different gadget. Okay. So let me it uh, looks tell like you yeah. of uh, sort of a, of uh, the two other uh, innovations that we came up with and that uh, Norberg has been using. Uh, so one uh, was uh, uh, a trap. We call it an actinomycete trap. So as I mentioned, uh, Selman Waxman. Uh, was uh, focusing on actinomycetes and showed that they are the most prolific producers of antibiotics. Uh, and we thought that it may be useful uh, in a perfect world uh, to have a diffusion chamber that only grows actinomycetes uh. and nothing else, right? Uh, and so we came up with the idea uh, of a trap, uh, and that is that, uh, and, and that really. Um, it was based uh, on the ability, the uh, unique ability of actinomyces to form uh, hyphae, which is, are you know, long thread-like appendices, just like uh, fungi do, and crawl through uh, solid media and through small pores. And so what we did, we took a slab of solid agar, sandwiched it between two semi-permeable membranes uh -huh. and made a diffusion chamber, but didn't inoculate it with anything. And that empty, sterile diffusion chamber went you know, onto the soil. And actinomyces were the only ones who were able to crawl into it. Ah. So it's essentially a lobster trap, I think. Yes. Right? Uh, for little teeny weeny things. Yeah. Yes. Right, ah. right, right. And so then, uh, after a while, they crawl in and form colonies, and now you have a trap that only grows actinomyces. So, so that was one thing that was developed in my lab and then it moved uh, to Nova Biotic. And then Slava in his lab developed uh, what you probably heard of as an eye chip. Yes. So Slava decided to take the idea of the diffusion uh, chamber and make sort of a massively parallel uh, variant of that uh, for two reasons. One, uh, just to have more yeah. uh, of the same in, in a small gadget, but more importantly, uh, to simultaneously isolate and culture yes. an organism. And, and that is achieved uh, in the eye chip, which is a little plastic platform with a lot of holes. Yeah. Uh, and if you take uh, that platform and dip it in a suspension of bacteria, each of those holes or wells captures a droplet with one cell, approximately one cell, right? So now you've automatically isolated it. You yeah. don't have to worry about purifying this organism then forms a pure colony, right? And if you have a lot of these uh, mini chambers, then of course you 
uh, speed up. Right. Isolate. Right. So that was the I chip, uh, and that's you know uh, it has been also used by Neurobiotic with quite some success. I see. So in first of all, let me get straight. It, in a sense, you can farm them, <laughs> so to speak, because one of the problems in the lab was they grow so slow. But this doesn't grow so slow. You're you're sort of scooping them in. Uh, they don't. Uh, uncultured bacteria do not grow in the lab at all. They don't okay. grow on the petri dish All right, dish so at it all. has to be okay. We grow them in their natural environment. Okay, right, and but you can get abundance. So once uh, they did grow in in, uh, in the in the fusion chamber in a trap, uh, then of course a big problem is how to move them. Yeah. Into uh, the lab. Tempt at, them into the lab. The <laughs> so what we discovered together with Slava is that uh, once a cell forms a colony in the diffusion chamber, then with high probability it will also grow on a petri dish. Okay. We call that domestication. Ah. Uh, uh, we do not quite understand the nature of that phenomenon, but it has been uh, obviously very useful. So it looks like the barrier, the real barrier, is for a single cell to form the first population. Once it did that, then it will also grow on a petri dish. Okay. Can you tell us in a way that we can understand how it works given a bacterium that is the target that it's going to, to attack, how it works? Are there different ways in which these selected microbes attack a germ mm -hmm. bacterium? Right. So uh, in the soil, uh, which is a very densely packed environment, you have about uh, a billion cells per gram of soil. Uh, they, of course, fight each other. Right. And they fight each other with antibiotics. Uh, and then we borrow those weapons to fight our pathogens. Right. And so we essentially, so the next step, once we have uncultured bacteria grow, growing on a Petri dish, uh, then we emulate uh, Selman Waxman's uh, method. Uh, so we take a colony of a potential producer of antibiotic, we plug it in the center of a petri dish, which is uh, seeded with uh, something like staph. Uh, and if there's a zone of inhibition of staph growth around the producing colony, we know that it's making an antibiotic. Okay. And then we can grow up this producer, uh, extract and separate into fractions, separate that. Uh, uh, stuff that it's been making and it purify the active ingredient, which is going to be an antibiotic. And so uh, that work has been uh, uh, conducted primarily by Nova Biotic. Okay. Uh, and to date, they discovered uh, 25 uh, new compounds, of which uh, the latest and perhaps the most exciting has been Texobactin. Uh, and that's what they, t in my lab, I and our collaborators have been focusing on. Right. What's so great about Texobactin, seeing as you've got an array here of possibilities, what and how does it work? Right. Uh, so one thing that we've been uh, looking for uh, is, of course, a, an antibiotic uh, to which there will be low probability of resistance development. Yes. Right. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we have a very simple test to do that. If you isolated a new uh, antimicrobial compound, a new antibiotic, uh, you put it in a petri dish, and then you seed onto that petri dish a large number of cells of, yeah. of a pathogen, and you look for resistant colonies to show up. And then you divide the number of resistance colonies by the number of cells that you seeded, and that gives you the probability of mutation, right? So it's very simple arithmetic. Right. Um, and so we did that I in my lab uh, with staph and uh, tuberculosis and at Nova Biotic. There have been extensive testing uh, against staph, and we couldn't find any resistant mutants. Right. And usually that is not a good thing, actually, uh, to find no resistant mutants. Um, so what you are uh, normally looking for, you're looking for a low probability of resistance. Oh, well, I see. High probability is obviously bad. That's a no-go. Right, 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 right. No resistance is usually also a no-go because that means that you discovered a new detergent. Uh, I bacteria see. Bacteria like to make detergents, stuff that we put, you know, in, right, uh, right. Uh, in, in, uh, in laundry wash. Um, 
And uh, detergents destroy membranes, both bacterial ah. membranes and our membranes, right? Uh, there's no specific I targets, see. there's nothing yeah. to mutate, there's right. no resistance development. So, so that's just sort of a boring proposition. But we have been on, on a lookout for interesting compounds uh, with very low resistance. And so in parallel, these have been tested against uh, mammalian cells for toxicity, uh -huh. right? So a detergent, of course, is toxic against right, mammalian right, right, cells. Right. This compound had no toxicity, no measurable toxicity against mammalian cells. And that's uh, when we uh, uh, sort of set up and... Got all excited, right. Yes, so did everybody was, else, right? That was, well, not at that point. At that point, a small number of people oh, I see. got excited, I see. right, at that point. Yeah. Because we felt that we have something, uh, something very interesting in our hands. And at that point, uh, so Lucy Link at uh, Nova Biotic ran uh, a very straightforward test. And the test was um, to see which important uh, process uh, in the cell this antibiotic is inhibiting. And by her test, she found that it's inhibition of cell wall biosynthesis. Yes, that's what I, the and, diagram. And that's yeah. also what penicillin uh, targets, that general process by a different mechanism. And so then uh, uh, we reasoned that, uh, okay, so have we, now we have a compound. Uh, we know that it's specific. It targets yeah, a uh -huh. specific function in the cell. There are no resistant mutants. And that suggests to us that it does not bind or inhibit a protein target. Most antibiotics uh, hit proteins, you know, uh, that have important functions in the cell. Proteins like the ribosome that makes yeah. other proteins, the DNA polymerase, uh, RNA polymerase, and so on. A and of course, proteins are coded by genes, and those, those can mutate. Uh, it, and yeah. the most uh, common mechanism of antibiotic resistance is when a protein changes in the way that it no longer binds an antibiotic. Okay. Right. So now it becomes uh, resistant to the antibiotic. So we figured uh, no, mu no mutations should be something which is not a protein. And what we know about the cell wall, it's made of, uh, of two major polymers, yeah. peptidoglycan and tachoic acid. Those polymers are not proteins, so yeah. if our compound binds to those, then there's not going to be any Right, you're home free, by, so to speak. By mutations. And so we, uh, at that point, we um, uh, uh, decided to, uh, to involve uh, Tanya Schneider's group. So Tanya Schneider is an expert in those precursors of, uh, of peptidoglycan and tocoic acid okay. polymers, right? She's a biochemist, that's what she does for a living. Um, and so uh, Tanya uh, gave us a little bit of the precursor, and I tested that uh, in my lab. It was a very simple test. Uh, we we add texobactin to staph, and it inhibits their growth. Yeah. And then we add that uh, precursor, which is called lipid 2, uh, to the suspension of cells, add texobactin again, and there's no effect. That means that texobactin binds to lipid 2 that we add. I see. Right. That means that that is what is the target of texobactin, a lipid 2. So that very simple experiment was followed on by Tanya's group with it. A uh, number of uh, very sophisticated uh, examinations where she found that that is indeed the case, she confirmed our uh, initial finding, uh, but also she found that it binds this uh, precursor of tachoic acid. So now there are two targets, right? They're somewhat similar but distinct. Um, so it binds two targets, none of which is mutable. Right. Oh, both of this, this is involves the cell wall. I just That's wanted correct. to make These sure are, that right. yeah, we These understand These two that. targets are right. precursors of cell wall right. polymers. Right. Uh, and there's another very important twist to this story, which is uh, relevant to resistance. Uh, so uh, bacteria have a number of resistance mechanisms. Some of them are highly sophisticated, like there's a whole biochemical pathway that modifies the target, right? But usually these highly sophisticated mechanisms come from an organism that produces the antibiotic. That kind of makes sense. If you're right, making right. an antibiotic, of course, you need to protect yourself. Right, right? Right. And the simplest way is to protect uh, your target, to modify it. 
And so, uh, so we were wondering uh, what's, what's going on with the producer. Now, the producer is a very interesting organism. First of all, it is not an actinomycete, uh, as producers of most right, antibiotics right. are. It's a, it belongs to a very different group. It's a, a beta proteobacterium, and it is a gram-negative organism, uh -huh. and that is important. Yes. So um, it came from, uh, from uh, you know, uh, not from a, a terribly exotic location. It came from a grassy field in Maine where uh, a, a, one of the Novobiotic employees were, was sampling soil. Um, uh, and then uh, that bacteria seemed uh, pretty interesting and unusual, and Amy Sporing, a scientist uh, at Novobiotic, picked it up, so, so she uh, discovered this bacterium uh, and felt that it's interesting enough to follow, uh, to follow through. So gram-negative bacteria have a second membrane. All cells will have a cytoplasmic membrane. Right. Gram-negative bacteria have a second membrane encircling the cell, and that second membrane has a very simple function to prevent penetration of antibiotics. Ah, that's why that's so resistant. Right. <laughs> so, so, so what did this be? So now, this uh, uh, bacterium that's making texobactin, it protects itself from this compound by exporting it across its outer membrane. It doesn't have any specific mechanism of resistance, it just throws it out. And since it cannot co come back, right. that's the resistance mechanism. That's amazing. So for yeah. a gram-positive bacteria that okay. it fits, there's nothing to borrow. There's no mechanism. They, can they cannot borrow an outer membrane, right? I it's see. It's not feasible. Uh, so it looks like this compound, Tixobactin, has this multi-layered protection from resistance. Uh, we've never seen anything like yeah, that. It's, I was going to say, this is uh, a real minority here. <laughs> Uh, and so, so it's clearly it evolved to be a, uh -huh. largely free from resistance, right? It's not an accident. But that also tells us uh, that uh, that is obviously not the only compound like that out there, right? We only scratched the surface, literally, of the planet. And so you think it's it not necessarily so rare as it would look like at the moment that you've discovered it. There may be others that have evolved this kind of mechanism. Uh, abs absolutely. I, I'd be astonished mm -hmm. if we, with a fairly modest effort, you mm -hmm. know, between our academic labs and mm -hmm. Novobiotic, mm -hmm. and the enormous planet Earth, is, yes. happened to hit the one and only Right, and all that compound. soil bacteria. Right, right. right. The enormous number of species. Right. Of course, this is not the one and only compound right. uh, that is largely free of resistance. Well, does that mean then that that is actually a leap in antibiotic research that you're you're looking now in a different direction altogether well, yes. so, so, because you've discovered this uh, mechanism? Uh, I would say yes. Uh, and uh, you see, we've we've all been operating under uh, the standard dogma, in the field, right? And our standard right. dogma right. is that. A bacteria will always develop resistance. Yeah. And so then you have really one option. Uh, and your one option is to discover compounds faster. Right. Then resistance is going to develop. Right. Uh, people have been advoc advocating uh, also another, if not approach, but a very useful thing, and that's judicious use of antibiotics, yeah. good stewardship. And that's, of course, absolutely necessary. But in reality, we can introduce such things in Europe, in America, but it is considerably harder, especially in short term, to introduce such things in third world countries right. where antibiotics are going to be sold over the counter right. for the foreseeable future. Right. Uh, and so really then our only option would have been to discover new antibiotics faster when pathogens acquire resistance. And now we have another option which we have not really th thought about as being realistic. And the option is to discover compounds with uh, very limited uh, propensity to resistance development. It's really quite amazing. And th this is e effective as far as you know against, you mentioned tuberculosis, which has been a disaster because it's coming back now and r it resists everything you throw at it. The other one is MRSA, this awful thing that 
we associate, I guess, with hospitals now that, that it's... Uh, and also with community. Oh, uh, I, I see, I see. MRSA is yeah, also in community. It, uh, but a number of these mm -hmm. things where you used to be able to take care of infections yeah. and diseases that were bacteria, suddenly they loom as really ominous. But this, it looks like, because it's a different avenue, it, it looks like it's highly effective. Uh, yeah, well, it is effective, and it's effective in mice, so it yeah. uh, cures uh, mice of a number of uh, uh, difficult-to-treat infections, but of course it's not yet in the clinic. Uh, that's the yeah. next thing, the, because uh, just to remind uh, viewers that uh, there are always concerns that mice are not human and so scientists can't run around doing this, uh, 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 testing these things on humans prematurely. What are the steps and what is yeah. the length of time? So the steps uh, are, first of all, uh, more uh, toxicity studies. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, more studies uh, uh, on efficacy and additional animal models. Uh, and then this compound, Texobactin, could enter into uh, human clinical trials. Uh, but it also has limited solubility. We would like to see a higher solubility compound where we can deliver, especially in humans if needed, a higher therapeutic dose. I and see. So Novobiotic now is uh, taking on a medicinal chemistry approach to get analogs of Texobactin with improved solubility. So these are sort of two parallel paths. Uh, I'm not yes. clear on that. Is that to, in order to uh, determine what dosage? Uh, is that that what it is no, no, that imagine. works so, with so different that, diseases? So, so, so it has limited solubility. Right? Uh -huh. We could cure a mouse. Mm -hmm. And as you said, a human is not a mouse. Mm -hmm. Now imagine that humans need a larger dose, mm -hmm. right? If humans need a larger dose, we need a, a more soluble compound. I see. So we can deliver that larger dose, right? So we need to be prepared to, for that eventuality. Right, I see. This looks very exciting. Is this a, 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 it had to be a big thrill for you and your lab and your colleagues. Yes. I think it's amazing just because it's a great leap forward, so to speak. It seems like a great leap forward. What do you predict for the future apart from developing this, which seems to be, you know, a given. Um, but the other is, it, it sounds as though there's a whole new track for microbiology now that, that people will be doing things in a different way. What is the future? Yeah. So, uh, so for, for Texobactin has a very complex mechanism of action. Uh, the reality today is that it is very difficult to come up with a compound like that using synthetic chemistry, mm. right? We're not there yet. Mm -hmm. So I think in the short term, in the, in the next, uh, you know, years, at least not decades, but mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. uh, probably uh, the best path forward uh, capitalizing on this discovery is to broaden the search for new exciting mm, takes mm -hmm, of actin, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? For new exciting antibiotics, mm -hmm. using the platform uh, that uh, nobiotic has been exploiting, the uncultured bacteria, mm -hmm. uh, and that is what hopefully we'll be able to do to enlarge that uh, effort. Uh, ultimately, of course, uh, uh, we people uh, will have to learn how to synthesize terrific antibiotics. We're just not there yet. Uh, but you do anticipate that they will synthesize this, th that they... Well, of course. Uh -huh. uh, you know, there's, there's no reason we shouldn't be able to. It's just that the, the state of the art uh, in chemistry and rational drug design is not quite there yet. Mm -hmm. But I, I think we'll get there. Mm. It's a really thrilling a moment. I, I think it must be tremendously gratifying at just this moment when people were throwing up their hands about bacteria, uh, about these bacterial infections, uh, that uh, you've come up with a, a fabulous discovery. So I think it must be very exciting on your end. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, to be fair, not everybody was throwing up their hands. I mean, there's a, a number, quite a number of labs and groups and companies that are working successfully uh, on the problem. I think. Uh, t what uh, we've contributed uh, rather uniquely uh, to the problem is to show 
that there is a method, not just a single compound, but there is a method that can be exploited, this discovery platform, yeah. uh, that will allow us to discover additional compounds. I see. Does this entail also retraining people who are going into microbiology, looking into this sort of thing, to, or this is just something no, I, new? I don't think, it, you know, it's fairly simple. As, as we okay. said in the beginning of, uh, yeah. of this conversation, the question was, you know, it's so simple, why didn't other people think of it? So I don't think this requires a lot of training. Okay, uh, all right. right. Um, so. So it will, it, will, it will be a different avenue in any case. Uh, I would like to point out before we close here that you've done some really exciting work on Lyme disease and a number of other things that uh, I hope to pursue at another point, but that your lab is really something that I hope because of the recent publicity will become much better known to the general public now. But I thank you very much for joining us today and giving us this wonderful discussion. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thanks for having me.